Good morning. My name is Laverne Macbeth from the Packwood Library, and today we have a local author, um, K.G. Maccabee, and she's uh, here with us today, and we're so glad to have her. And today she's going to tell us about some of her work and some of the projects that she's working on. Um, Gail, I'm going to give you the floor. My name is K.G. Maccabee. I've been writing all my life, but I've been professionally published the last 20 years. My current project is I'm working on a series of children's stories set in the Revolutionary War in South Carolina because there was so much excitement going on. And as much as I love history and history classes, sometimes that excitement doesn't really come through. There was adventure, there was excitement, there was there were thrills, and I think kids need to know about that. And there were more battles fought in South Carolina in the Revolutionary War than in any other part of the country. So take that, Bunker Hill. I'm also working on short stories for anthologies, um, more short stories for anthologies, short stories for science fiction, and short stories for a lovely pulp magazine that publishes in Canada called Pulp Literature. I really like pulp. Um, as you can see, I write a lot of horror, fantasy, science fiction, steampunk, and a lot of other stuff. <laughs> so again, I write what I like to read, and I like to read everything. I write very strong women, very strong, powerful women characters, because my major inspirations when I was a kid were Lois Lane and Sheena, Queen of the Jungle. So there you go. My women are strong, smart, powerful, and in charge. I love uh, it. I have a, a character naming source book that uh, Sherilyn Kenyon wrote. And it's wonderful because it's divided by different nationalities and it's got first names, a few last names. And also it's important because it tells you what the name means. And so you want a good strong name with a good strong meaning for your characters. And since Gilded Cages is um, steampunk set in, in England, you know, of course I want to go very strong English names, hence the Simon and the Abigail. And since mm -hmm. my name is Gail, I'm always partial to Abigail. Inspirations, ideas, we are surrounded and submerged in them all the time. How can you not have ideas for stories? And um, I will admit now, I am not a plotter. I am a pantser. I literally sit down, the character kind of shows up on the screen and I start writing about her. And uh, I can't really decide where it's going while I'm writing it. But luckily, so far, I've managed to end a lot of things. Doesn't, doesn't mean I've ended everything, but I've managed to end a lot of my stories comfortably. <laughs> and I'm glad you're enjoying Gilded Cages. That's a collaboration with a friend of mine, uh, Cynthia Witherspoon, who is also an amazing writer. And it's really fun. We literally alternated chapters and points of view and the few writers that I'm comfortable writing with and that we sort of get on each other's wavelength and are able to uh, succeed. When did you first start writing? I'm pretty sure I was, well, certainly by first grade, because I remember the first story that I wrote was about a little girl who climbed up on a table and broke the glass cover and I drew illustrations and it was on that old uh, rough paper that you had in the first grade that had like wood chips in it and everything and I still remember writing that in in print and drawing a little picture of me sitting on the table breaking something and boom that was 65 years ago. <laughs> Read a few words since then. And you say you like um, smart women, strong women. Mm -hmm. Any inspiration from history? Oh, oh gosh, yes. <laughs> um, Queen Elizabeth I, one of my big heroes. Queen Victoria in a lot of ways. Um, the kind of women who, in the Victorian age, who went around traveling by themselves in, in, in strange countries, um, jumping on a camel and 
you know, riding into the desert and everything, incredibly powerful. And of course, a lot of my favorite writers write about strong women. Robert A. Heinlein, the uh, science fiction writer, most of his women were very, very smart and very, very strong. And that's what I like to think I am, but at least I certainly write about women like that. What about your writing process? Mm, I think I always have stories going on in my head that kind of, the best description I saw it was uh, by another woman writer. She said that constant chatter, chatter, chatter in your head that just turns into stories for some of us. And her description was, uh, the first line was, Katie drives like a maniac. Yeah, how can you not jump in and write something like that? And just, you know, go for that. They're literally, because everything you take into your head, everything that you see, all the TV shows you watch, all the movies, all the books you read, kind of simmers away down in your, in that swamp of your subconscious. And every so often, this bubble comes up and pops and there's a story in it. And then all you have to do is acquire the skills with grammar and punctuation and writing how to, how to describe things and tell things. And then it just sort of like comes out the ends of your fingers. At least it does for me. <laughs> you talked about working with other authors. Um, how, did, how did that start? How you guys meet? How you start doing that brainstorming and meeting? How did that connection start? It's mm, the first person I collaborated with was by literally by snail mail. Uh, he was publishing a series of pulp magazines because he was a big pulp magazine fan. I sent him a story. He said, yes, this is excellent. I will publish it in my next, at my next issue. Would you like to collaborate? I said, certainly. And he did very much like um, Cynthia Witherspoon and I do. We would alternate chapters. He'd send me a chapter, leaving it kind of wide open at the end because the cliffhangers are fun. And I'd take what he sent me, write something, and send it back to him. And we were literally doing this. It was taking weeks at a time because, of course, we were sending it back and forth in the mail. Then I've run across other people that I've collaborated on. Um, this is called Tales from Omega Station. And if you can tell, there are four authors in it. What we did, we, we took a, what they called a shared world universe. We designed, the four of us sitting together, designed talking about um, and a planet way out on the edge of the galaxy, a very, what kind of people would live there on the surface where all the rich people live in their fancy domes and then going down, digging into the earth? Where do these other people live? What kind of things happen to them? So we've got villains and heroes and soldiers and thieves and criminals and family people all interacting and living together. And so you create almost a world and then all four of you go and play in it. And that's always fun. And then other collaborations, I don't know. You meet people, you're on the same wavelength. You write, they write, it works together. It's a very uncommon thing, I think, but it's really fun when it works out. The joy of writing for you, what's the greatest part of it? There is a, for me at least, there is a thrill like no other, the creation process to craft a sentence, a paragraph, a story that resonates with somebody else. Uh, we were talking earlier about illustrations of some of my, of my stories and to find people, artists who listen to what I have said, read what I have said and then turn it into an illustration that is so close to what I saw in my head, that is a magical and exciting thing. It's uh, that kind of communication through the, all these different levels. I think of something, I write it down, somebody else reads it, somebody else just draws a picture of it, and it's like, wow, that almost incredibly Alchem al alchemical kind of thing, this magical thing that this is what we do. This is a true form of communication that sadly we seem to be lacking a lot of times between human beings. So exciting to be able to do that. 
And with the illustration, um, did they come to you or did you be advertised for them? How's that process? Generally, that's a the publishing house takes care of that. That's what happened with this. This is a publishing house called Wildcat Books. I had published several things in their in their science fiction magazines, and they came to me and said, all right, we've got enough stories now to do an anthology of your work. Um, we're going to find an, an somebody who will draw the cover and illustrate some of the stories in it. I said, okay, cool. Sounds like fun. And the artist ended, ended up being an English artist named Nick Neocleus, and he um, draws things like uh, Doctor Who trading cards and Indiana Jones stuff. And it was a real thrill and very exciting to have somebody of that quality illustrating my work. Now, a lot of my things that are self-published and quite a bit of my stuff is, literally, you can go find some cool stuff online <laughs> and create your own covers. So, so but the, the um, actual collaboration between a writer and an artist is just... It fascinates me because I cannot draw anything, but apparently what comes out of here can, someone else can illustrate that, which is just astonishes me. So that's sort of kind of how it works out. I don't really have a whole lot of input in the process, much like um, book covers. I really never have any kind of process or, or interaction with uh, the publishing houses that do it. But when I do it my, myself, it's kind of cool to be able to um, find something that illustrates what you're see what you're seeing in your head. Because writers are weird. <laughs> We're telling stories all the time to, to invisible people. It's just, it's fun and exciting and the absolutely the best fun you could possibly have. So when you're not writing, how do you spend your time? Uh, reading and thinking about writing. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> what other authors do you enjoy? Oh my goodness. Um, I love Robert A. Heinlein and science fiction. I love Tolkien and all of his fantasy. I love the the golden age mystery writers from the 30s in England, uh, Agatha Christie and Marjorie Allingham and Dorothy Lee Sayers. I like Dickens and Austin and the Bronte sisters. I like um, Alistair McLean and Timothy Zahn and Roger Zelazny. And literally I could go on forever because I read everything. I also like history and science. I read Neil deGrasse Tyson's work. I love uh, Barbara Tuchman's uh, histories. Uh, it's easier to say what I don't read. And even then I'm not quite sure I could pick something that I don't read. Uh, ketchup bottles. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. Five. Give us five of your favorite books and why. Um, Robert A. Heinlein's Double Star, because it's uh, it's an, a concept that I love. Somebody pretending to be somebody else and not always succeeding at it. I think that's fascinating. Um, Roger Zelazny's Chronicles of Amber. Uh, and I'm cheating there because there are literally 10 books in the series, but the whole thing is the Chronicles of Amber. And it's just absolutely brilliant. The writing style is clean and crisp and, and very narrowed down. And then he'll suddenly get all excited and do something very poetic. And then I'll go back to the story. All right, that's two. I love the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Um, oh gosh. It's like asking who are your favorite children, you know? Um, okay, that's three. I oh, know, right? <laughs> three. Um, I love um, Dorothy Lee Sayers' um, book, Busman's Honeymoon. It's a mystery set in the 1930s. I love that. All right. Okay, two more. Now, let me see. Oh, gosh. Decisions, decisions. Okay, I'm going to cheat again. Uh, Patrick O'Brien read a wonderful series set in the Napoleonic Wars in the British Navy. And uh, the first one is called Master and Commander. And the entire series is just brilliant. And the he evokes the time period so well and his characters are st so strong that I can literally read that and then read it again. 
And then, oh gosh. And again, of course, it depends on the like the time of day, but I also like Elizabeth Peters mysteries set in Egypt where her uh, main character is uh, an Egyptologist. And those are just so funny and smart and brilliant. And um, her, I can just, again, I can reread those. Some things are just eminently rereadable. So I think that's five, although I cheated and threw in like, like 30 more, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> And what, what advice can you give to anybody who want to get into writing and become an author? What, what kind of advice can you give them? You need to have your skill set in place first. You need to be able to write and know grammar and punctuation. This is important. This is what represents you when you submit a story. So your skill set is not like you'll say, go out and build me a house, but I don't know anything about carpentry. No, uh, you've got to be able to know that first. Then there is an enormous amount of information online that you can go and research. The markets are just astonishing. Um, there are plenty of free places online that have that are like clearing houses for writers. There's one called Literarium, and you can go there and say, I have a short story of 5,000 words that science fiction, and you can enter in those parameters, and it'll say, oh, look, here are some markets for you that are looking for just this. There's another one called Submission Grinder, which is very, very similar, a, a market clearing house. There's another one called, and it's not free, but it's a valuable resource, it's called Duotrope. And they have a lot of markets. So, and then of course, you know, researching publishers and magazines and asking, inviting, you know, having them send you guidelines, going and requesting guidelines, and then submitting something. Write it. Um, Robert A. Heinlein, my favorite writer, he has five rules for writing. You must write. You must finish what you write. You must submit what you write. You must keep it on the market until it sells, and you must never rewrite unless the editor insists on it. So, if you follow those rules and keep at it, how can you possibly fail? Trust me, I know. <laughs> Trust me, I'm a writer. I know these things. <laughs> you first, uh, started writing at the age of five. Mm -hmm. okay. So if you could go back into time to your five-year-old self, mm -hmm. what would you tell her? I would tell her, first of all, the world is going to change in a lot of interesting ways and you're going to love most of them and that you really need to keep doing what you're doing, which means reading everything you can get your hand on and also remembering that that is your training to be a writer, reading, see how other people do things and look at reading as not just the funnest thing to do in the world, but also a training course for you when you become a writer. And she probably wouldn't appreciate that, but she was going to read anyway. So <laughs> she wouldn't, she'd ignore me, but she would keep reading. Now I'm just going to let you have the floor again to talk about some of your projects that you have done and maybe even kind of give us a little teaser about any kind of future projects that you're doing. I am working on a science fiction novella that I want to submit to the Writers of the Future contest. Uh, I'm also working on a mystery novella that is going to be a sequel to the uh, the novella I wrote that won the uh, Black Orchid Award and was published in Alfred Hitchcock because I thought we needed more mysteries set in mill villages in the South. So that's a cool, and I have, I like the characters from the first one. It's kind of 1920s after the First World War when mill villages were basically ruled everything in the South. And it's fascinating to do that research and to think about what these characters went through, what they thought about. So my main character is a young boy who works in the, in the company store and reads all the pulp magazines and wants to be a writer like Mr. Dashiell Hammett and Mr. Raymond Chandler and Mr. Edgar Wallace. So he wants to do that. So he's always carries a notebook and a pencil, a big yellow pencil in his pocket, and he goes around and investigates things. So that's fun. And the whole venue of the South, and basically, of course, it's set in the Paclet Mill Village, 
basically. So it's really fun to be able to do that. So that's two projects and there are probably 37 more, but we don't want to talk about those right now. <laughs> Agatha Christie one time said, someone asked her, where do you get your ideas? And she said, well, ideas are no problem. Ideas just fall on you. The hard part about writing is which one of those ideas are you going to work on next? And that has always been a problem for me because the next project sounds like it's going to be more fun than the one you're working on. And you think by now I would know that that's not true, but it still always seems like it's going to be more fun the next one. So you kind of put this one aside or you rush through it to get started on the next one. And then there's a next one after that. So, yep, it's a rough life, but hey, I'm managing. <laughs> Well, I see that you brought some of your work with you on, on your table. Mm -hmm. Do you want to share a couple of um, titles on the table? Certainly. Um, this is one of my more recent short stories. Uh, Miskatonic University. It's called Welcome to Miskatonic University. H.P. Uh, Lovecraft was a pulp writer in the 20s and the 30s. He wrote horror kind of what he called cosmic horror, it been an enormous influence on Stephen King and all the other horror writers. And the publishing house set out a call that they wanted stories set in the fictional Miskatonic University that he created where really weird, strange stuff happens. So I've got wormholes and um, kind of, yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> That one's one of my more recent ones. Um, this was an interesting anthology. Um, threads. I found it listed, I think, on Submission Grinder. They said they wanted to see stories, uh, fantasy stories. Um, I was excited to be accepted in the anthology because I think there are 15 stories in it. They said they had 2,400 submissions. I was delighted that I was one of the ones that made it. So that was fun. And I um, told you about my, my kids' story set in the Revolutionary War in South Carolina. Fun, a fun project. Um, I have spies and um, excitement and cliffhangers and just all the fun stuff that I like to read anyway. And let's see, what else? Um, several years ago, I wrote a submission for Writers of the Future. Um, they have a quarterly contest and the winner gets to go into the, um, the yearly contest. It was fun. I enjoyed it. I got an honorable mention for it, which was pretty exciting. Um, they didn't want to publish it in their anthology, but I found a wonderful magazine that published it in Canada. So I'm kind of thinking I need a sequel to that one. In fact, I've already started a sequel for that one. Um, there's a wonderful, a lot of old pulp and new pulp, uh, things like The Phantom and um, let's see what else, you know, a lot, a lot of interesting things like that. They put together an anthology several years ago, uh, Chicks in Capes, female superheroes written by women, illustrated by women and edited by women. That's a fun, that was fun to do. So I created a superhero who's an, an archaeologist in Egypt and ends up being possessed by some of the ancient Egyptian gods. So she gets really cool powers. Fun. Let's see what else. There's an English publisher that's called Flame Tree Publishing. They do wonderful anthologies of older work and then new work that kind of fits into it. So this is called Lost Worlds. So I wrote a story about a lost world underneath one of the frozen lakes in Antarctica because I had read that that water down there had been cut off from the rest of the world for literally millions of years. So what's going to be down there? That was fun to write. Uh, what am I saying? Everything's fun to write. Um, there's also a sweet little publisher that they do kid stories about a little girl who can't have a real dog. So she has a wire dog made out of wire. So we wrote, a lot of uh, writers have been sending them stories using Wire Dog and the little girl in it, Ellen, the little girl, and what kind of things are they getting into? 
So for you writers out there, they are looking for short stories about Wire Dog. So think about that if you want to do some kid stuff. Um, I am also working on a, um, a collection of essays with another writer in Chicago about aging and some of the fun things, fun things you can do when you retire. So that's fun. I have also done um, essays for um, a friend of mine who pulled together this called Games and Libraries. So I wrote an essay for that one called Welcome to My Multiverse. Um, creating games where you can use other books that you love and integrate them into the game. So that's fun. Oh, gosh. Pulp. <laughs> um, the Phantom Detective, uh, not The Shadow or Doc Savage, but quite a few of the other uh, second tier ones are in public domain. And there are, uh, there's a publisher called Altus Press that publishes new stories based on the old pulp masters from back in the day. So those are fun. Um, gosh, Alfred Hitchcock, been in there. Uh, gosh, I've been in a lot of anthologies. So. <laughs> and of course, collaborating with my with my other writer friends, always fun. Um, this one that's set on uh, Omega Station, we're working on a sequel for that. Um, Two other friends of mine and, and I did another shared world anthology about um, a hollowed out asteroid that, that um, the last remnants of hu humanity got on board to be sent to another uh, solar system because our sun was dying. So it's all, ho all hollowed out. And of course, because it takes so long to get to other places and a few little accidents happened, different cultures have developed within that world. So we, I have an anthropologist who travels around, tries to inoculate people about against diseases and not interfere with their uh, civilizations, but to document it for, because she's an anthropologist, that's what she does. So those are fun. Um, gosh, I have too many projects going on, y'all. <laughs> um, some of the Things on the poster back here, there's a really cool place called Smashwords Online where you can self-publish uh, your short stories. So that's been really useful for me to pull in a lot of uh, short stories that didn't necessarily fit anywhere else. So I can design a cover, publish them there, and they distribute them for me to places like um, Barnes & Noble and other, other spots online. Always fun. I think I have 20 or 30 stories there. Always fun to do. Your favorite place you like to travel? Oh, Scotland, without a doubt. When I was um, 10, I read Robert Louis Stevenson's Kidnapped. And uh, and my name is Maccabee, too. So I've got, you know, lots of, I'm just drawn to the country. And that has always been where my heart lives. And so four years ago, we got to go to Edinburgh. We spent um, 10 days in Scotland, Edinburgh, Loch Ness, up into the Highlands, Glencoe, uh, Aberdeen, Inverness, just, I mean, they just, it's just poetry falling off your mouth. And then guys and kills. So. <laughs> <laughs> and which location gave you your most inspiration? When we were in Egypt to go inside the Great Pyramid, and to climb up inside there and to see graffiti that Napoleon left 200 years ago. And, um, and then to go into the king's chamber and there's this massive stone sarcophagus. And our tour guide said, anybody wanna lay down in the sarcophagus? So who raises her hand? <laughs> so I climb into this massive granite sarcophagus and lay down and look up and think, this. This is 3,500 years of history floating around me. You know, it's it's here, it's there. How many other people have seen this, done this, felt this? That and walking into Westminster Abbey and seeing the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier with the, can, with the 
candles around it and the guard on duty and thinking about the the length of English history and all the people who were buried there. And then, of course, walking over to the Poets' Corner and seeing Charlotte Bronte's plaque, her, the, the Bronte plaque with Charlotte Emily and Anne. Those, that just burst into tears there. So it, it's an amazing world. <laughs> it really is. Wow, thank you so much, uh, KG. Thank you, Maccabee. Thank you so much for coming to the Packet Library and just sharing your knowledge and your inspiration and your joy we talk about your projects and your your process your, your writing process is that you can see as you love it oh, and yes. we we and me as a as a reader as a librarian i appreciate it so um once again thank you so much for um being a part of this um online virtual meeting and um Chinese public library my name is abraham mcbeth and i'm the uh, packwood branch librarian and I will see you guys later.